machine gun fire in Somalia. Or rhythmic, textured, interesting sound. Interviews with stowaways. Frequency Horizon. Hey, welcome to episode 110 of the Frequency Horizon. I'm Drew Penner, your skipper for the outing. Just like you and you know, average people. And so they became headline news when they were all abandoned there on the ship. The Outlaw Ocean, Ian Urbina's book of New York Times investigative reporting, is dripping with the most fascinating details of deep sea murkiness. Song lyrics, for example, overheard at a dodgy Filipino recruitment marketplace calling out the desperate plight of maritime workers, or the cannibalism case that made it likely illegal to jump off a Mexican ship in international waters to swallow abortion pills, while be legal to do the same thing on an Austrian boat there. And how U.S. prohibition had the unintended consequence of launching the flag of convenience system where vessel owners seek the lowest common regulatory denominator. The Outlaw Ocean is arguably the most thorough account to date of the seedy side of ocean life, and perhaps the only thing more surprising than discovering someone's cracked the code on the high seas underworld is finding out the same guy just dropped an overwhelming body of ambient, dubstep, drum and bass, and house music as part of the same endeavor. The Outlaw Ocean Project is an incredible milestone in modern journalism and audio production, so we're dedicating the entirety of episode 110 of the Frequency Horizon to playing tracks by its myriad musical participants, exploring the themes brought up in the New York Times bestselling book, and chatting with Urbina himself about how he managed to steer his ship towards breathtaking musical handiwork. We've got tracks by Tin Liquor, Truth, D-Day One on the way, and before we're through, we'll reconnect with the previous Frequency Horizon guest who headed to work at sea for the first time, and we'll catch up with another still dealing with the fallout of a maritime tragedy. So grab your galoshes and pirate bandanas, or your reporter's notebook if you prefer, because we're about to set sail. This is the Frequency Horizon. A Cambodian man named Langlong spent three years captive aboard a Thai fishing trawler. I'm going to start out by playing the song that I heard that introduced me to Ian Urbina's project. Langlong was courted by a human trafficker, offered a job in the construction industry. It's muffler, slave labor, which I heard on the Hospital Records podcast. He had not a cent to his name and couldn't pay the trafficker. Now he had a debt, and that trafficker sold Langlong to a fishing boat captain, and off they went. And this is where you start to see the delicate mix of journalism, original composition, and sound design all being woven together for a larger aim. Because Langlong had attempted to escape at one point, he was subsequently shackled by the neck whenever he wasn't working. That shackling is what got noticed by a supply vessel that serviced one of these fishing boats. That began a whole long negotiation to buy Langlong's freedom. The next couple of years, I sort of tracked him as Langlong attempted to put his life back together. village in the Philippines had produced several dozen men. These 
guys went to Singapore. Then when they got to Singapore, they were locked in the apartment. Some of them were raped there by the guy that banned the door. They wait for deployment, and they get deployed, and that's when the real hell starts. It's how most of them die. Either they try to escape and they can't swim, or they try to escape and they're caught and they are beaten. Often they're not killed from the beating, they're killed from the infection from the beating. And infection kills a lot of these guys. up to doing this podcast i downloaded audible and started listening to the audiobook version of the outlaw ocean here's a few other factoids that stuck with me so far you learn about an undercover Ghanaian reporter who's so feared for his investigations of arms dealers warlords and corrupt government officials his name is invoked by african rappers four thousand hong kongers scored passports to an outlaw nation off the coast of Britain called Sealand in the lead up to the Chinese handover. And it turns out it's surprisingly easy to launch a corporate takeover of a merchant ship, employing a mixture of bribery, cunning, and international legal maneuvering. Glad I still have a few chapters left to go through. All right, that was Muffler, Slave Labor. Next up, we've got Adaptive with Last Call.
I'd say the outlaw ocean points to what Ian Urbina calls the inconvenient truth of globalization. That it's based more on market sleight of hand than on Adam Smith's invisible hand. But what's so cool about the ethos behind the stories is that it unabashedly delves into core human emotions of loneliness, incredulity, and fear. Take this quote for example. The thing about danger is you become desensitized to it the more you experience it and emerge unscathed, Urbina writes. I don't experience danger as a drug, nor do I seek it out simply for the thrill, but you become somewhat inured to fear. Ain't that the truth? All right, that was adaptive. Last call. Next up, we got Berlin-based Aka Aka with Rainbow Warriors, which refers to the Greenpeace ships that are pretty well known for launching high-stakes maneuvers to raise awareness about environmental issues. It was the COVID-19 crisis that made me think it might be time to do an episode on the ocean-going world. First, it was the big sign on the 405 freeway that said, No access to hospital ship, which hinted at a potential public bum rush of a military vessel. Next, I began noticing more and more giant ships would be floating in the sunset off the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach every time I'd go surfing at some of the few beaches not yet closed during the pandemic. Those in Orange County. At one point, a local newscast said there were 24 tankers bobbing along as oil went into negative territory. And my sleep schedule has been totally reversed as I sleep later in the day and worked on my podcast late into the night since what little might have been available to do overnight had effectively dropped to zero. My curiosity peaked, my boredom pervasive. On multiple occasions, I headed out into the silent darkness to watch as containers piled up in supersized Lego setups and to take photos of vessels at port from a distance. By the way, I've been wanting to do a story about the Sea Shepherd environmental activists ever since one of their ilk started following me on Twitter a while back. Shout out to Harry Milkman, a volunteer Sea Shepherd crew member from Vermont. When I listened to the first chapter of Irbina's audiobook, where he joins the Sea Shepherd peeps during the longest boat chase in history, I figured doing a whole episode on the Outlaw Ocean Project would be a cool way to tackle these issues indirectly. But let's get back to the more Greenpeace samples we got going on in the background right now, how about? Get there, and normally 
when a drilling rig sets up operation, it has a security zone under law that it's allowed to establish around it. And other vessels and protesters and whoever else companies are not allowed to enter that zone. Greenpeace figured in plan B they would head up to the location and enter the security zone, but not attempt, as they had in previous campaigns, to climb on board the rig, but just to occupy an area within the security zone, hold up signs, gather their publicity, and argue that they were not posing a security threat by simply being within the zone. Sealand said Bates would make him a fortune. Quite how has never been clear. And the nearer you get to the principality, the more unlikely it all seems. In response to the international outcry about sea slavery and human trafficking problems, the Thai government in the past several years has done a lot to try to address the problems. They still have a ways to go, and one of the goals I had in reporting in Thailand was to take a close look at how the government was attempting to find these cases, and specifically their at-sea spot check program, as well as their in-port inspection program. I managed to rejig my schedule enough towards daylight hours for my sit-down over the phone interview with Ian Urbina himself. And in the background, you're going to hear a couple of Ocean Outlaw music project tracks the first one being Lemongrass Esperanza, and then 110 Days from Hazini. Uh, my name is Ian Urbina, and I'm the author of uh, The Outlaw Ocean and uh, The Outlaw Ocean Music Project. Right on. So, The Outlaw Ocean, would you say that was your first really big sort of writing project of that magnitude, or is that something that you'd been doing for quite some time before that writing project? Yeah, so um, no, I've been a journalist all my life, um, been on staff at the New York Times for the past 17 years, um, and was a freelancer for about 10 years before that. Um, so um, I've been uh, doing this kind of journalism, long form investigative journalism for several decades. Um, the Outlaw Ocean was a series that um, was different than most other I had done in its novelty, in its um, uh, sort of um, scope, uh, in its international travel, and in its difficulty. Um, this is really distinct. Um, but generally speaking, I, I report on you know environmental human rights and labor crimes. That's kind of cool overall to have a journalism project that ends up becoming something uh, you know immersive in terms of the musical side of things. What do you think is the link that ties this writing together with the music project that ended up coming to fruition? Mm -hmm. The music project was sort of born of a simple question, which was, um, you know, why should movies be the only things that have soundtracks? Why can't a book have a soundtrack? And then, wouldn't it be even cooler if, if the soundtrack for this book um, wasn't just music inspired by, set to the mood of the reporting, but also music that drew from uh, the actual fabric of the reporting itself, by which I meant um, the sound from field recordings of the six years of reporting at sea, um, those sounds would be perhaps um, you know, kind of collected into an archive and, and then put at the disposal of musicians so that they could use them almost like a chef might use, you know, seasonings, you know, um, and make music that on the one hand is um, uh, touching on the characters or the issues or the scenes in the reporting. And so that sets the tone. Um, and then also uh, where feasible, um, drawing from uh, the actual field recordings um, from the reporting. And those field recordings could be um, textured sound like machine gun fire in Somalia or chanting deckhands on the South China Sea, sort of rhythmic, textured, interesting sound. Or they could be prose, and those were um, its own archive of um, stuff with words, right? So interviews with stowaways or um, you know, speeches from radio ship, from ship captains over the uh, ship radio um, by advocates, Sea Shepherd and Greenpeace and um, 
interviews with uh, you know sea slaves, these deckhands who were kept captive on ships. Um, Secretary of State John Kerry, you know, speaking at the UN about the reporting. So just like lots of different other um, material that artists um, uh, could use, and uh, and indeed they did. You know, they used these materials and and engaged with the reporting and created these this amazing you know body of music. It's funny because in a way, when you're writing an article, you're kind of like a chef in the sense that there's a lot that goes into it. But if you're doing your job well, maybe people don't actually think about that. And you want people just to sort of enjoy the dish or you want people to kind of get the message of, of what you're putting into the writing. But I'm wondering, you know, having worked on this music project as well, are there sort of elements that are similar between the musical aspect as well as the journalism that are, you know, have more similarities than people might think of? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's a really smart question. I do think um, one of the risks here was um, if if the concept um, was too enticing to musicians, they would end up making a concept piece, not music, right? And so on the front end of these conversations I had with artists, I emphasized to them that at the end of the day, we wanted music first, concept second. So I wanted them to really very much lean into the concept here, lean into the reporting, lean into the prose, but don't make something that people don't want to listen to. Don't make a, a long lecture with a beat behind it. Make music that has interesting content behind it. Um, and um, much like you say, as the chef doesn't want to kill the soup with too much of one ingredient or another, um, the songs needed to be just great music and then um, by um, respecting the listener and their tastes um, and sort of gently uh, adding some content to the music um, it invited I think listeners um, uh, more gently into um, ideally through their own curiosity um, listening to a song and wondering wait why is it called that and what's up with this album cover and where's that sound come from and what was that that little snippet of a sound bite and then their curiosity causes them to look further and when they look further they look into the reporting and now all of a sudden we've we've got them looking into the very journalism that I hoped to bring them to but very gently so we're going to look into a bit more of that music that was spun out of this journalistic work because there's a lot to get to and throughout this whole two-hour podcast that's even just scratching the surface Next up, we got Bad Tuner with Adelaide's Voyage.
bapak pulang uang habis gimana sebenarnya gajinya gak segitu uang dari ibu teren itu yang diperjuangkan sama ibu teren untuk bayar utang itu saya cuma harapkan uang itu aja jumpa Bad Tuner with Adelaide's Voyage. Next up, we got D Day One with Better Future. CO2 and affect climate change. Your drilling operation needs to be stopped. Ship of peace, working for, working for, working for, working for a better future, 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 future,
day one with better future all this talk of oceanic pursuits made me think about interesting pictures that have been flitting across my facebook timeline recently shared by previous frequency horizon contributor bernardo de la torre i remembered he'd just gotten a job as a cook at a fish farming camp just off the coast of vancouver island so i figured i'd reach out to him to see what it was like and to give you guys a sense of what working on the ocean is all about. And we're going to do it to the sounds of DJ Taj Rashid, Wild Ocean, because Chill Step is life. Hello, my name is Bernardo de la Torre, and I'm making an audio clip for Frequency Horizon. So I got a hold of these wonderful people. I didn't know anything about it. It was um, my wife's ex that got me this work. He told me to see these people as my children and feed them in the kitchen. So I thought it was a good idea. So I took the job and just grabbed a bunch of knives, took some chutney and some yerba mate, which is uh, an Argentinian tea, and went to work. So Diversify Marine, it's a manpower company that provides mainly workforce for the salmon farm industry, mainly. I was cooking meals for 20 to 30 people, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and an extra meal in the middle of the night. The scenery is amazing. It's um, full of uh, wildlife from crows to seagulls to sea lions um, salmon wild salmon uh, all kinds of birds and all kinds of um, different uh, fauna and flora too I mean there's lots of uh, forestry and it's amazing it's it just it's just a really really empowering um, place to be there's also like the boat that we're staying that we were staying in. It was 62 years old. Uh, it was initialized as a government boat, but it was super old and um, like custom made, and it was uh, like a really old school experience to stay in this like big boat with um, 20 rooms and um, there's all kinds of uh, like legendary ghost stories about it and. Um, it's really nice to stay in these like legendary boats, I guess. Wow, Bernie had an amazing time out there, just offshore. Of course, a lot of people have concerns about the environmental risks of fish farming, and a lot of First Nations activists are against them. But it sounds like Bernie got to work for a pretty reputable outfit in Canadian waters. That's a far cry from the ridiculous abuses chronicled in the outlaw ocean which describes the banality of life without contact with loved ones poor medical treatment for injured fishermen and the endless cycle of debt but we'll get to that later for now let's play a track bernie was inspired to write 
with a coworker while out there contemplating the beauty of the ocean. This is Tristan and Bernie, Fish Farm Gold River. This is a track that I made with Tristan, a guy that had a little bit of a heart attack. <laughs> And then uh, he had to go home, and um, we we kind of made something really fast, but he ended up making sense, and I'm sharing it with you guys. Goodbye. Tristan and Bernie, Fish Farm Gold River. Thanks again, guys, for digging deep and pitching in. Hope Tristan's getting better from his heart attack. Well, let's turn our gaze back to the outlaw ocean. Rain or shine, shifts can run 18 to 20 hours. At night, the crew cast their nets when the small silverfish they target, mostly jack mackerel and herring, were more reflective and easier to spot in darker waters. During the day, when the sun was high, temperatures topped 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but they worked nonstop. Drinking water was tightly rationed. Most countertops were crawling with roaches. The toilet was a removable wooden floorboard on the deck. At night, vermin cleaned the boys' unwashed plates. The ship's mangy dog barely lifted her head when rats, which roamed on the board, like carefree city squirrels, ate from her bowl. I thought it was pretty cool I got a chance to tell Ian about how I feel like the music that he's helped to create and put out into the world can in turn help the musical purveyors communicate a message that might not be so easy to do in the current environment. I know for sure I heard that muffler song on the Hospital Records podcast. I feel like I heard it somewhere else too, like maybe Bass Drive or something. But regardless, the work's getting out there. The song that I actually heard that uh, brought me to reaching out to you was Muffler Slave Labor. And the reason that 
it kind of struck me besides just the beauty of the piece originally and even the story behind it was not just oh they're they're putting this in there because it you know it's something that is interesting or different but there was something within this that i felt spoke to the core mission and i was just curious to know if there was something that you were trying to do when either reaching out to these artists or whatever in order to make sure that the ultimate product the music product spoke in the language that was very relevant to those genres of music as well as just being a vehicle for the stories yeah i mean i kind of had a range of broad ambitions here um, and the ambitions of the project were um, not genre specific um, so one ambition was an experiment in translation and by that i mean um, translating from the explicit writing of you know kind of non-fiction journalism you know um, into this other medium that is musical and working with the storytellers that are musicians um, and handing the content over to them so they could um, you know do their thing with with my original reporting and I just wanted to sort of try the collaboration of that translation and see how it went you know see what they came up with um, the, the other experiment was almost a, a tactical one that relates to the business of journalism. Um, I do think the New York Times is a great, incredible venue, and um, it reaches a huge audience. Um, but I, I wanted, you know, I have a 16-year-old son, and he doesn't read the New York Times, but he consumes a lot of news, and he consumes a massive amount of um, music. And, you know, I just thought, how do I get, you know, my reporting to... Um, his demographic. And then how do I get my reporting to um, folks in India, China, Sri Lanka, you know? Um, um, and I thought, what, what if both of those things might be achieved by um, going through other channels? And what if we were to commandeer Spotify and Pandora and find a creative way into those platforms where we could grab at those, the attention of those consumers. And so that was the other experiment here, was um, taking journalism to other places, to other listeners, and entering those listeners, you know, rather than through their eyes, through their ears. And, you know, th so that, that was the other experiment. And then, you know, the genre-specific question you ask is, um, you know, electronic, EDM, trance, you know, th these forms of music are where we started. We're now, you know, working on albums that are classical and jazz and hip-hop and um, uh, but we started with electronic partially because that demographic of musician sort of got it. You know, they're used to using found sound. They're used to, you know, mixing really weird ingredients. They're used to doing it all on their own at their computer. Um, and so for that reason, it seemed like the, the logical place to start with the experiment. And what has it taught you so far? What have you learned? I mean, it, does it work? Or are there some things that work better than others? I mean, I think a lot of journalists are probably asking themselves these questions right now. Maybe not a lot of them have done it. Um, are there obstacles that you have found that you weren't expecting? And are there certain things that have translated better story-wise than others? Yeah, I mean, I, the lessons learned are somewhat in the weeds. Um, it's, what have I found? Um, the music industry is a complicated terrain and it takes a, you know, a steep learning curve to figure out how you um, uh, get the music from just that MP4 file out to the audience and sort of the whole way that um, music gets, conf digital music, you know, gets consumed is really intricate. And then even once you get it onto these platforms, um, figuring out how to access the playlisting, you know, realm and all, all that stuff. I've learned a lot about um, those challenges. Um, I think we're doing pretty darn well, but um, that was a steep learning curve. Um, I've found, I, I was somewhat surprised by um, the genres that we've gotten very little traction with. Like jazz has been really, really tough to break in to. Um, Whereas classical was not as difficult. Um, once I realized that I shouldn't be going, I should really focus on individual um, instrumentalists like solo pianists and solo violinists. 
um, we were running into a problem with approaching artists who only played in orchestras and the economics of getting that many people together just doesn't work and so just little things like that um, from a model perspective um, electronic uh, you know was in some ways um, uh, the most accessible for the reasons I cited um, and um, yeah I mean I think uh, we're still learning a lot about how you make this next move from getting the music in large quantities onto these platforms and getting attention to them to um, then translating, you know, kind of converting that access into other forms of access. So Spotify and Pandora are now, are just now sort of saying, hey, we see you having something that we want, which is journalism, storytelling, and video. You know, we've got a lot of audio, but we don't have great imagery, great things to look at and stories. And so, each of those venues, Pandora and Spotify, um, who, who wouldn't give me the time of day on the front end, now are like, oh, we get it, we love it, and we want to offer you these special um, sort of plat spaces on our platform where you can start putting video. And that's exactly what I dreamed would happen, because once we get there, then we can actually start pushing some real journalistic content. So, um, you know, it, we're learning every day as to sort of how to navigate the strange land that is the music field. Probably a lot of you guys can relate to that, hey? Simply put, the music business is a complicated space, particularly when you're trying to get a very, very important message across. In the background, besides the muffler reprise, we had Hazini with Crash Zone and Kettle with Lawless Place. Next up, out of Moscow, Russia, we've got Fraunhofer Diffraction, The Sense of Urgency. sense of urgency and the nature of the problems out there have to be framed in a way that the public at large understands and cares about.
All right, that was pretty intense from Fraunhofer for diffraction. It was the sense of urgency. I hope you guys have a chance to catch your breath there for a second because the next one's pretty upbeat. It's PD Mac, Peaceful Protest. As you can see, we are still in the process of conducting a peaceful protest. 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 As you can see, we are still in the process of conducting a peaceful protest. Peaceful protest. Peaceful protest. Peaceful protest. Peaceful protest. Peaceful protest. Get the name of that song. It's Peaceful Protest by PD Mac. And the next one? It's a bit more cinematic. It's Radiology Storming the Thunder. Ba bow. This is a situation in the Thai fishing sector specifically uh, that's been going on since the 90s at least, as far as we can tell. Um, it has involved the complicity and, in some cases, the direct involvement of Thai officials. You saw a very significant decrease in catch rates across the last several decades. That means ships have to spend 25 plus times more time at sea to catch the same amount of fish. And as a result, some ship captains have been forced either out of the fishing sector or to go into other businesses because fishing is no longer economically viable. Not know when it's going to end. It's also not know for sure what will happen with this vessel when it finally does go to port.
now the industry is facing mounting pressure from vital trade partners in Europe and the US. The EU has threatened to ban Thai fishing imports, which is a multi-billion dollar industry. So Thailand would stand to lose billions of dollars in sales to the EU if it doesn't clean up its fishing sector soon. If you suddenly strip out forced labor, uh, an industry can, can fall apart, and maybe it should. In Renong in Western Thailand, we found fishermen increasingly turning to another line of business. Boat owners told us that they are converting their boats to carry people instead of fish. He says he knows of at least 10 local boats who are transporting around 12,000 Rohingya migrants a month. These 12,000 migrants could generate up to $24 million in ransom payments. As boat owners become more involved with the traffickers' operations, Survivors say there has been a grim evolution in this trade of people. As their jungle camps are shut down, trafficking syndicates are reportedly taking their operations offshore to cargo ships acting as holding pens for thousands of Rohingyas, facilitated by Thai fishing boats. The goal of this reporting trip, and this book more broadly, was to bear witness to a world rarely seen. It recounts a maritime repo man spiriting a tanker from a Greek port in international waters, and a doctor clandestinely shuttling pregnant women from Mexican shores to the high seas to administer otherwise illegal abortions. It chronicles the work of vigilante conservationists who in the South Atlantic Ocean chased Interpol's most wanted poacher ship, and then in the Antarctic hunted and harassed Japan's last factory whaling ship. In the South China Sea, I landed in the middle of an armed standoff between two countries, each of which had taken hostages from the other. Off the coast of Somalia, I found myself temporarily stranded on a small wooden fishing boat in pirate-infested waters. I saw a ship sink rode out violent storms, and watched a near mutiny. All right, we got Louis Futon, bottom of the ocean, in the background. It's funny because, in a way, I feel like I almost would have been better served to some extent, having a course on some of these weedy activities that you were saying, <laughs> like when I was uh, going to Ryerson Journalism in, uh, in Toronto, as opposed to, you know, some of the, the print classes, while well, they served me pretty good for, you know, the first few years of my career as a journalist, you know, at this point, to be honest, I probably would be better off having studied more about 
MP4 codex or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> the, mar the marketplace has really changed and I'm not sure the educational sort of curriculum has kept pace. It's why, to some degree, you, you, I, I do believe like you learn best just on the job, you know, kind of um, figuring things out by taking them apart, putting them back together. I think there's plenty to think about there. There's literally hundreds of artists that have been involved in taking parts of Ian Urbina's reporting apart and putting them back together in a musical form. And I'm itching to play you my favorite track so far that I've come across. It's another one from Muffler. It's called Slow Motion Slaughter. Check it out. Slaughter by Muffler. But let's dial it back a bit. And play Shanti People, Protection, for a little down tempo break.
I'd say that's a textbook example of what you call Shanti Hop. That's Shanti people, protection. How did you fall in love with the ocean? <laughs> I, um, so I was an anthropologist um, or a doctoral student in the anthropology program um, before I became a journalist and um, I was sort of burnt out on my dissertation and I took some time off. I was in Chicago and, and um, uh, took some time off and, and wanted to get as far away from the cold winter of Chicago as I could so I took a job on a ship uh, that was anchored in Singapore to work as an anthropologist and that kind of like exposed me to this strange world. Mostly the, the strange world of seafarers more than the sea um, and just the this kind of diaspora um, tribe of, of traveling and largely invisible um, workers of which there were quite a lot and you know of lots of different sorts and had these epic stories and you know kind of culture of their own language of their own you know so I just became like super fascinated by them folk you know and um, then I went back to grad school and always harbored this thought in my head that like, wow, like uh, if I could choose my topic anew, I'd probably choose sort of the anthropology of that workforce. And uh, then I ended up at the time, New York Times, and you know, um, continued to harbor that curiosity about that topic. And and finally, you know, I pitched this The Outlaw Ocean as a series to several editors until I finally you know, several years in, um, pitched it at an editor who really liked it, and she um, uh, greenlit it, and uh, off we went, and, you know, um, the rest is history. It's pretty serious subject matter that you go through in the book, from illegal fishing to arms trafficking, gun running, you know, dumping, all these kind of things. Um, and I was just kind of curious right now with the whole world being thrown into pandemic mode and whatnot. You know, a lot of Americans are getting checks coming in um, to pay their rent, you know, thousands of dollars and whatnot. But um, people at sea, you know, maybe they're not afforded the same kind of protections and whatnot. As I see 24 plus oil tankers alone just floating off the, off the shore here of the port in Los Angeles, um, I'm just thinking, you know, there's probably crazy stories that are going on at sea that people mm -hmm. aren't even thinking about. What are what are some of the, the topics that are jumping into your mind mm -hmm. that you wish you could scream out and say, geez, don't forget about this during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good and in many ways empathic instinct of yours there. I think, um, you know, point one is to bear in mind that, you know, it's a huge workforce, right? So like we think of the sea as this sort of expanse you know, the shades of blue that you typically fly over and it's relatively kind of a water desert where no one is. But um, 56 million people work out there, you know, and 90% of the products we consume comes by way of the ocean. And so first it's important, I think, like to bear in mind that we're talking about a lot of people that you are distinctly invisible. A lot of them are trafficked, a lot of them are migrant workers, a lot of them are undocumented, um, and they're out in this space um, namely the international waters of you know high seas where government sort of jurisdiction is murky at best um, if it exists at all so so it's it's really I think important to just like get your head around the notion of the workforce on the frontier and then like to put it in pando pandemic mode I mean there's one specific category of concern that the book touches on um, one problem in particular that rarely gets discussed but it's pretty um, widespread and that is the abandonment of seafarers and that's um, this situation where you know um, a ship you know uh, uh, is owned by you know, some company in Taiwan or Greece or France or whatever and um, for whatever reason um, maybe the company gets sued or maybe something on the ship breaks and it's expensive to fix it or maybe you know, whatever the the the, the owner sh the owner company of, of the ship um, sells it to another company, and that new company, you know, needs nine twelve months to, to get its paperwork in order, and it doesn't really plan on paying those guys who worked doing stuff um, for the three months prior the sale occurred. For lots of complicated reasons, um, these ships sometimes are cut loose overnight, and literally the the captain on the ship who typically is calling um, back to 
headquarters to find out where they're headed next and what they're supposed to be doing and what they should do about a certain situation that's emerged, something's broken or they're being held in port or whatever, um, suddenly those calls aren't answered. They, no one will pick up the phone and they're stuck and they don't have the fuel to, to like go to their next port or get home and they don't have the papers, you know, the immigration papers to go to the nearest port and, and get off the boat, right? They're not legally allowed to be in that country. So they're really stuck, you know, and um, this is not an unusual problem and, you know, really desperate um, kind of human tragedies unfold in slow motion where this is a very male, male workforce. So these guys, you know, sometimes five, sometimes 50, you know, will be on a ship and they're abandoned and they can, you know, there've been cases where guys are surviving, you know, for a year and a half, two years. And, you know, they don't have clean water and they don't have a source for getting food. And uh, some of them try to, you know, maybe they're a half mile from shore, but they still can't get off and go legally into land. Uh, so, so anyway, I think um, that problem is a big problem in the best of times when co commerce is booming and the, the commercial circulatory system of the planet is, you know, kind of pulsating and right now everything is stopped. So I'm intuiting that that problem is probably on steroids right now. And you've got a lot of really desperate, I mean, we saw this story with the, the passengers on cruise ships, right? And the reason those stories made the news is because those people who were stuck were just like you and me, they were average people. And so they became headline news when they were all abandoned there on the ship. But the truth is like that sort of abandonment has been happening to these workers for a long time. And I bet you it's going on a lot right now. I've, I've, I know it is because I've, I've gotten emails from some such folk. Actually, there's a piece that I got a heads up on about one such situation that I passed on to the Times. And there's a story apparently coming out this weekend about them, but that's a cruise ship. But I'm really talking about the, the merchant mer marine vessels, the container ships, the tankers, the freighters, and, and then, you know, the larger fishing vessels too. That's where these guys um, more typically are. It sure gave me a lot to think about as I was driving around South Los Angeles along Long Beach and curving around the Pacific Palisades, wondering about the stories of the people below deck, those who couldn't get to shore. I wondered if there was a way to learn more about them. Anyways, in the background, that was D-Day 1, Will to Survive, and then Tekla, Waste Away. Next up, let's play a really cool track called The Tide by Tin Liquor. I feel like you're gonna love this.
That was Tin Liquor. The Tide. This next one was a particularly standout track to me. It starts off innocently enough, and it doesn't try to be too bombastic or anything like that. But I don't know if you'll find, as I did, that there's strains buried within that tug at you and stick in your noggin. It's Boogie Belgique with Bunker. Hey, that's Boogie Belgique Bunker, and they're actually from, you guessed it, Belgium, which has an added relevance to this story, considering what I decided to do to get a better sense of what's going on in the high seas now was to look back at a contact I'd made previously, someone who had dealt with immense, immense pain at the hands of the ocean, 
and the poor response of a company at sea. I'm talking about the death of 19-year-old Shatij Singh Bisht, a brand new Indian seafarer who died in an accident at a Belgian port, and his twin brother, Sagar Singh Bisht, coming up on the third year anniversary of his twin's death on the MSC Damla. He's still writhing. He's still frustrated. He's still trying to figure out how to move on. And he's still maintaining contact with other Indian seafarers on the ocean. I reached him kind of near the Himalayas in his new home. We're listening to subsets of Void in the background. Hey, Sagar. Hi, Andrew. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing, man? I'm great. I'm great. I'll just turn off my video so that we have maximum input to our audio. Uh, how are you holding up during these difficult times? The whole world is shook up right now and things have been really different right now. It's going stir crazy a little bit because especially now, just these last few days, they've shut down all the beaches near my house, so I can't even go surfing now. Up until a couple days ago, I only had to drive 45 minutes away and I could get to really good waves, very open beaches and, you know, manageable wave conditions. It was a, a nice respite from being locked in my house. Unfortunately, now that they've they've uh, increased the lockdown orders in, in multiple other places, so there's really nowhere near my house that I can go surfing. So. I've been holding out okay for now, but I don't know how it's going to be in the next week or two, you know? Great for you. We have been under a strict lockdown since the last 45 days or so. And especially in India, everything was closed. Even uh, we were uh, just given time for grocery shopping uh, from morning 7 to 11. And rest all day, all things were under lockdown. Nobody was allowed to roam on the streets or go outside for a stroll, mall, school, colleges, multiplexes, all are closed right now in India. Could you tell me a little bit about your brother and then tell me what happened to him? He had an accident on MSA Damla in the year 2017 on the 28th of March. What happened to him was just a sheer negligence of responsibility on the part of his seniors. On his second day of his training, he was sent to the cargo hold alone at night at around 11.15 in the night and then suddenly he fell, slipped and fell from a height of about 16 meters. Uh, the doctors came on the boat really late, the things were not going fine at all. At 12.50 uh, the doctors came on board, at 1.05 they declared him brain dead and at 1.10 they declared him dead finally. And about 10 days of fighting with the government, with the company, we finally received his body in India at our home on 6th of April 2017. Talking on the part of the government, not much help was given until we talked to the, someone in the ministry. Swasana Swaraj, the Ministry of External, the Minister of External Affairs of India, the, she helped us a lot at that time. The company official were ambiguous at that time, but they did help a bit after the incident, not during it and they certainly people in the company, few people in the company, not all of them, but few people, they did not have basic human decency. There were a lot of posts about my brother, how things should have been different, how people should not take human life so irresponsibly, a novice like him should not have been sent in the cargo hood all alone. It has been three years now and it's still difficult for me and my family. For me, my complete life changed, my, uh, the well-being of my family changed, my mom still cries. There are times she still gets emotional, my father, he gets emotional. The home does not feel like home anymore. Sometimes I do just want to go away from the home and far away as possible because it does not feel like home. The festivities, the celebration, they don't feel good anymore. But yeah, I'm trying my best. I'm trying to get over with it. Pushing myself towards more and more time to work. I recently started my uh, MBA. So I'm doing MBA in marketing. You're taking a marketing course, you said? Yes, I'm doing MBA. I'm doing a post-graduation uh, in uh, Master of Business Administration. 
in marketing. And you said you're also working for uh, some type of internship or something? Yeah, I'm working for an internship for a startup basically in aggravator for co-working spaces. It's based out of India. It's really exciting. I get a chance to talk to a lot of different people throughout and a lot of startup founders and CEOs. Did you ever end up working on a cruise ship? Yes, I did went and worked for MSC Cruises. I just worked there for about 10 days. But yeah, I did went there and apparently I got really disturbed working on a cruise ship, especially uh, it was a horrifying situation for me. Since I had a brother who lost his life on a ship, me working on a ship and especially under the same company, it was kind of a difficult for me. Uh, so within 10 days, I just quit the job and I came back to India. Now, knowing about what's happening during the coronavirus crisis, mm -hmm. do you think about the people that are working on those kind of ships that are stuck at sea? What do you think about when you hear the news about all the, the, the things that are going on with the lockdown in terms of people who work at sea? Uh, one of my friends who also works for a cruise liner, they were stuck on near the port of Miami. They are stuck there for about a month or so. I don't have an update right now, but about 10 days ago, he was really frustrated. I got his voice message and he really sounded desperate. He cannot return to India and at the same time, they cannot disembark at Miami port. So living in on a ship with no guests and not much of a work was really a difficult scenario with them. But the most difficult thing for them was uh, if on a cruise line, if there is an outbreak of coronavirus, how difficult would it be for them? I saw a lot of memes uh, from uh, my brother's friend who are on ship right now. So talking about a lockdown for them, it was given and I quote, uh, lockdown must be new for you, but we sailors, we live our life under the lockdown. We live our life under social distancing and quarantine. There are a lot of seafarers who want to return to their contract and earn their wages right now because though they don't have money right now, they were about to join the vessel, but now right now they cannot join the vessel. So it has created a difficult situation for them financially and emotionally. The guy that was stuck off the coast of Miami, was he on an MSC cruise line or was it Carnival, do you know, or what? He was from MSC cruise line. MSC Divina was stuck there near the port of Miami. Uh, there were about four MSC ships and a uh, ship from Carnival lines as well. But uh, what he told me that he was stuck on MSC Divina and there was about 102 Indian cruise members. How did he say they were being treated? I mean, did he say anything about that? Uh, according to him, the top officials of the cruise ship, the people from the HR have already left the ship, but a uh, few of the crew members, they were being left on the ship and they did not have much of the hope. Since the ministry in India was not doing anything for them, for them, the company was saying that we have booked and chartered a uh, flight for you, but until the ministry in India gives them a clearance to get their flight in the Indian airspace, they won't be able to get them back by a chartered flight. What do you want people to know about um, what seafarers might be facing today during the coronavirus crisis? For me, right now, the most difficult thing for them is to be with the family. Even if your contract is over, you have been working on the ship for about uh, nine months or maybe 10 months. And still you are not able to go back to your home. You are stranded in a foreign land, not even on land. You are stranded on a ship and you're just seeing water 24-7 you're not getting proper sunlight you are in a continuous state of dilemma whether you will be back home or not so that's the most difficult thing for them after going through what you went through with your brother's death and now seeing what's happening to all the seafarers around the world what does it make you realize about how law is applied on the ocean and that kind of thing. I mean, what should people know about that? For me, there should be stricter laws, especially on the ocean, especially in the international water, domestic water. As more and more people are being taken care of as they are on land, people, especially when they are on ship, they are not given that care. Laws are really flexible over there. People try to bend the rules and regulations, and it does create a difficult scenario. Companies should provide more counseling services to the seafarer. 
फॉर एग्जाम्पल आई टेल यू वाई डोंट मोस्ट ऑफ द क्रूज कंपनीज हैव अ काउंसलर ऑन बोर्ड इवन डू दे डू हैव काउंसलर ऑन बोर्ड देयर स्टाफ डज नॉट हैव अ टाइम टू गो एंड सी अ काउंसलर अ काउंसलिंग इज रियली इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर अ क्रू ऑन बोर्ड यू डू हैव काउंसलर ऑन बोर्ड and when it comes to uh, the container ships or the box ships they don't have counselor or medical help on board uh, even if they don't have counselors on board companies should do something like uh, a counselor should get uh, them therapy through a video call or something like that that's really necessary because they are living in in the confinement and since we all are under lockdown we certainly no do know how it feels to be under uh, social distancing away from the new things every day not able to go out to different places so yeah it does take toll on their mind and the companies especially the big companies should have a services like an online counseling session for the crew on board i'm glad to hear that you're making some positive things happen in your life trying out marketing and and yeah to make an appeal to all be safe at home you'll get time to go out and live your life again thanks for doing this uh let's talk soon okay okay bro take care super good to talk to that guy i wish him the best by the way that other track in there was triphonic and the song's also called avoid but next up i'm going to play you guys a song that i wrote at the time I was investigating the death of Shatish Singh Bisht and it features a spoken word poem by the very talented Jamie Cowling. I just called it Shatish which is K S H I T I J. Life lost too soon as waters reached ends and horizons blackness peaked beyond waves touching metal stakes. Cutting, glistening visions of movements just as twins enlighten one another's dreams a mother tells their stories a father molds their love duly conditioned formulations creating uniquely the emotion encompassing one's family life precious gift meaning stems from doing precisely that chasing confidently the directions you seek the ones that make the most sense the journey momentously beautiful once profoundly noticed why as our homes reside within us knowing through passings that we never ever go away the links you share with each other is severed not in fact when it feels ripped away or broken proves only its strength and that is exactly how it will continue to draw each of you closer in time now then before and the future trust in the peace and light of your hearts knowing how each memory is imprinted onto your energies throughout eternity nothing will ever suck out or take that connection away for what we carry inside is known never dies nor fades simply moves cascadingly pouring life existing connecting crescents of moonlit sky dives intrinsically understood past the pain seeing you still smiling always for free you are and protecting us now you glide guiding the streams of our family back home carried with us throughout eternity
Lost Frequency Horizon with Shatij. Continuing with the theme of voids, we've got a monster of a track here. From the illustrious, the one and only, Truth. It's called, simply, Voids. The sea bottom is a world over which scientists, conservationists, industry, and governments routinely tussle for access and control. And yet we have mapped more of the night sky than we have charted the ocean's depths. Lawlessness on the high seas may be rampant, but deep underwater there are immense voids, literal and legal. I wanted to explore those voids firsthand. conservationists, industry, and governments routinely tussle for access and control. And yet we have mapped more of the night sky than we have charted the ocean's depths. Lawlessness on the high seas may be rampant, but deep underwater there are immense voids. still on deck. Hope you battered down the hatches. Whew. That was a good one. That was voids. Let's get back into my conversation with Mr. Urbina. We're joining the back and forth at the point where I'm musing a bit about how producing journalistic works involving these kind of oceanic stories is easier said than done. Despite the fact that the volume of these kind of tales is for sure as immense as the ocean itself. Yeah, when I've ever tried to do stories like that in the past, um, I don't know, it just, it seems like it's a super untapped area, mm -hmm. but I'm always blown away by how little people seem to care. Mm -hmm. It's not that they don't care, like they, if you take the time to break it down for them, mm -hmm. of course they care. Mm -hmm. And in their own mind, they do, they care. Like if you were to say, do you care about the they like, yes, I totally, but even if you're pitching it to an editor mm -hmm. or you know something like that, 
I just it's I find people have a hard time getting their 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 hand around it, you know, to, yeah. to figure out why should I care? And and I guess that's maybe my last question I should ask you is um, you know, why should people care? Mm-hmm. I mean, these are stories that are far from their lives mm-hmm. or, you know, whatever. I mean, what 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 would you say to those people? Well, I mean, I think again you make a really good point that's very much a journalistic point and before I answer the second question I'll go to the first comment. Um the, the they don't care. I mean, I have a theory about that which developed in the course of doing the reporting for this book and that is that um I think that acute crimes, dramatic crimes are easy to to tell the story around. They have an immediate audience because they click, they're dramatic, they're in technicolor. Editors immediately get it. So, you know, we did a piece about, you know, this this murder of these guys that was caught on camera. Um, and, you know, it's a murder and you see it and, you know, it's like really plain as day. It's an acute crime. Or the rape of these other guys on another ship. And those, it's not hard to get editors or readers um, uh, you know, sort of their heart rate going about that. The the slow motion cl- crimes, the crimes of neglect, th- those are a category of crimes that are equally deadly, but they take longer. And those are the ones that are, as a category, harder to get you as a journalist, I think we're just saying it, to get editors um, excited about and to get readers to care about. And um, in some ways, I feel like journalistically, there's a higher order of heroism in tackling those tougher stories because they're tougher, you know, and, and, but they really deserve um, the attention of um, journalism and of readers. And so uh, anyway, so I very much agree with your observation and that's um, sort of in my own head how I kind of explain what that's about. Um, but in general, whether it's acute or chronic, whether it's slow motion or, or, or otherwise, like I think um, the crimes as chronicled in the outlaw ocean, um, I think why should people care about any of it? Um, well, I think most people are fundamental. I think we, we as humans, I think are ethical creatures. And, and if we are complicit in, if we're tacitly involved in, if we're associated with in any way something that's really bad. I think most people, once they're confronted with it, um, it bothers them. And we're all complicit in these crimes. So on an ethical level, you know, if you're buying products that have a good chance of having them brought to you by human slavery or by environmental, severe environmental abuses, it's, it's probably not going to sit well with you. Um, whether you'll change your buying habits, whether you'll care after you stop reading it, I don't know, you know, that, that varies um, uh, per person and per day of the week. Um, but I think in general, people care on an ethical level. I think they also care on a practical level because like um, these crimes ultimately do start catching up with us. So dumping, of, you know, the environmental ones, we run out of fish, we're gonna have a big problem. You know, like we have human slavery in certain places in the world, those sorts of crimes eventually contribute to political destabilization, civil war, starvation, you know, like bigger problems that expand and they begin to affect not just those people, but everyone and us included. So I think like, you know, um, if you can find a way to explain how these crimes ethically should concern you and then practically very well could catch up with you, then you're doing the job of journalism, <laughs> first of all. And secondly, a lot of readers, I think, will um, begin to care. And then the next question is, okay, I care, but what do I do about it? And that's an even tougher question because these are big, sprawling problems. But that's a whole other episode. That's, that's the question you're supposed to ask at the end, right? <laughs> what can, what can I do about it? too bad you ran out of time. Yeah, like that's usually what people end with. And it's usually the one I try to duck because I don't like that very structure that you... Um, uh, it's too... Um, I mean, I, I, the book is about an entire universe of problems and a, a taxonomy of 20 different problems. And so it's hard. And the solutions for, you know, private maritime security guards killing with impunity is different than ocean plastic, is different from murder of stowaways and overfishing. You know, these are all very different problems, all that are connected by a lack of governance at sea, but the specific fixes are not the same, you know? 
So I, and I think it's the question that people like to ask at the end because it helps get them off the hook. Oh, you know, if you just support this one cause or this or that, right? Yeah. That's why I almost wasn't going to ask it because, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, it, you can't just do one thing. And I think you got to kind of start with education first. But uh, yeah, and I would but I would I would also just add that, like, I think it's worth, though, saying, like, hey, look, don't try to do everything like, you know, pick the thing that you that moves you the most of the many different things discussed and then just like take that on for starters read about it learn about it figure out who's doing good work get involved see what they suggest but don't like try to take them all on and or feel demoralized if you can't impact them all um th that's the worst thing to do just don't do that I could talk to you for a lot longer <laughs> but uh I think I've... I'll let you go for now maybe we can talk again sometime sounds great um yeah I really just started getting into the into the book last night and it's it's a really incredible read and you know just don't don't stop doing that kind of stuff thanks and yeah hopefully we can talk again sometime i'd appreciate that thanks so much have a good one bye, bye, -bye. all right guys like it or not we've reached our home port big thank you to ian urbina for being willing to do this the guys behind the scenes for letting me use the music in the episode i just hope it can even do the tiniest thing to get the word out about some of these stories thanks to you guys for tuning in good luck to sagar singh bisht marketing's a tough world as well but it's a fun one if you can get your claws into it thanks to bernardo de la torre for sharing your story about what it was like to work at sea. But like stowaways to a grand ocean voyage, we're gonna sneak a couple extra tracks in before we disembark. First up, that's gonna be Jericho with the QO at the end, empty waves, and then we'll roll right into Tidy, small ty, capital D-I, for the first time. We got a big format change to the show coming next week that is pretty exciting. And I don't want to jinx it. So I'm not gonna tell you what it is yet. So stay tuned. But till then, peace. Empty waves, empty pool. So around me, so around me. Trust me now, catch our fall. Surround me, just surround me We could wait till later To fix what's going on But if tomorrow takes us Then maybe it's no world to get the fall FYI As my feet promise me tonight we're gonna end this fight. I'm drowning in your eyes. Just promise me I'll try. So we don't ever die. So we don't ever die. Chasing me too Broken glass In street lights Silhouette Fogged up windows And smoke the pure away. I still open my eyes And see you for the first time I still open my eyes And see you for the first time
Tell me is that hopeless Or is that gone too Broken glass In street lights silhouette Fogged up windows And smoke submarine in Antarctica and South Atlantic Oceans, to offshore weapons depots in the Gulf of Oman, and to oil platforms in the Arctic and Celebes Sea. For all the adventure, though, the most important thing I saw from ships all around the world, and have tried in this book to capture, was an ocean woefully underprotected, and the mayhem and misery often faced by those who work these waters.